Okay, and in this week's podcast, the episode title is Getting Your Accounting and Administrative House in Order for Strategic Change. And I'm thrilled to introduce Scott Mega, Market Managing Partner, South Florida at Grant Thornton. Scott is an audit partner with an industry focus in financial services, private equity, aviation, manufacturing, distribution and technology for both public and private companies. He leads the Florida private equity practice and is also a member of the National Private Equity Leadership Team. And our focus today, as I mentioned, is getting your accounting and administrative, administrative house in order, especially in anticipation of strategic changes, such as growth, IPO, sale, succession transition, or relocation. Scott, I'm thrilled to have you on the show, man. This is, this is awesome. We've known each other for over two decades now, and um, this is going to be great. I'm happy that you're going to be here to share your wisdom bite, Scott. Yeah, no, thanks for the opportunity. I'm a, I'm a growing fan of podcasts, and uh, when, I, when, when you mentioned this, it was something that uh, I was very interested in doing. So I, I'm looking forward to it, and uh, again, appreciate the opportunity. No, 100%, Scott, 100%. So let's kick it off. So when a business is just beginning, what are the fundamental accounting and administrative controls and processes that should be established at inception in order to in order to ensure a strong foundation for future growth? Well, I mean, I, what I would tell you uh, for for companies that are just starting off from an accounting and finance perspective, you, you really need to have a, a bookkeeping process in place because it's important for the owners to know what the financial picture of that company is at any point in time, um, and no more than a month should go by without them having a true understanding. The, the bookkeeping function doesn't have to be overly sophisticated, just needs to be timely and accurate. Um, it can, you can, the, the group can use a third party. They can outsource it to a third party accounting firm. They can outsource it to a consulting firm, or they can take it in-house at some point, but you, you really need to have the bookkeeping system in place. The other thing I would tell you that's important is from a control perspective, you don't have to have a full-fledged system of controls in place, but you want to have really good ad and adequate controls around cash receipts and cash disbursements because um, small business is tough enough to run. You, you really need to avoid fraud and theft and putting control simple controls in place around cash receipts and disbursements is not an expensive uh, thing to do. Um, and, it, and it's really an important thing to, to have in place. Wonderful. No, Scott, absolutely. And so... What are, you know, you got the bookkeeping function. What are the type of financial reports or financial statements that should be important for the uh, for the entrepreneur or founder who's just starting off? Yeah, so obviously an income statement is important, a, a true income statement, capturing all the costs of the business on an accrual method, not just a cash basis method, because there could be charges that are accruing to the company that's impacting that company's profitability, where the actual invoices may come in later. But to get a true feel for matching revenues and expenses, it needs to be on the approval basis. One of the issues I see all the time is, is new companies reporting on a cash basis of accounting um, and then be caught off guard, you know, months later when they realize that they have all these, you know, disbursements that are due that they hadn't been accounting for. So um, accrual basis accounting is important. Obviously, having a set of financials that are comparable. Um, so that you can see exactly how the company is growing and also a system in place to compare those monthly financials to budget um, so that you know whether you're really attaining the goal that you've set out at the beginning of the year to see if you're actually hitting your marks and the people that are working for you, whether they're hitting their marks. 100% Scott. And, you know, this is what I've seen in entrepreneurial type businesses is, uh, you know, they somewhat lose the context and the context has got to be something to your point, whether it's a plan, a budget or versus last year. There's got to be some level of comparison, whether it's, you know, a vertical or horizontal trend analysis or so. But no, thank yeah. you. So you mentioned, uh, you know, particularly controls around cash. All right. Um, what about the 13 week cash flow and cash flow forecasting? Because as we all know, profits don't necessarily equal cash. And so establishing that those levels of controls. Give us a little bit more about the cash controls. Right. We said, you know, incomings and outgoings. What about things like bank reconciliations and, you know, other types of reconciliations that would support the balance sheets and P&L? Well, I mean, the bank reconciliation is, is, is really just another control to identify theft. I mean, it, it, it's not really a control around profitability. You just want to ensure 
that the cash for your accounting records is equal to the cash in your bank account. And if it isn't, somebody probably stealing money um, unless there's an accounting mistake along the way. Um, so that's really, again, a fraud prevention tool from a, from a budgeting and, and profitability tool. You know, the income statement and accurate reporting, to your point, the 13 week cash flow projection is important because one of the things that tends to happen to smaller companies is they realize or recognize too late that they are capital constrained. And as you know, Richard, is when you're trying to negotiate capital, the last thing you want to do is be desperate. Um, and a 13-week forecast and, and a rolling 13-week forecast will, have, will allow the company to know exactly what their requirements are going to look like over the next couple of month periods so that if they do are in need of capital, they can start addressing that need before they become desperate. Got it. And so we're going to go through kind of the maturity of the, the accounting cycle. We won't spend too much time about the early days, but but let's just touch on a couple of points. You know, maybe a bookkeeping function, maybe an accountant of some sort, maybe as you say, you outsource it. Um, perhaps is it a QuickBook system? Just give a little bit of flavor for those early days because, you know, the next the next level of growth could be, look, an entrepreneur, maybe family and friends may have seed money, et cetera, but it's very possible the next stage of growth is going to require some level of cash infusion or some type of funding, right? So just talk a little bit about, you know, the hiring perhaps needs at an early stage and type of system that um, early stage companies would, would usually want to implement. Yeah. So in the old days, not that long ago, old days, it would, it would have been Excel. Um, people would have been maintaining a, an accounting record on, on Excel. And if you know anything about accounting, it's not double-based. It doesn't require double-based uh, accounting. So you could end up booking entries that don't balance. Yeah. Um, what's nice about some of the newer, uh, re relatively newer accounting systems is they're not that expensive and they're really effective. So QuickBooks is a perfect example of what was originally set up to be very small businesses running on QuickBooks. We've got clients that are several hundred million in revenue still operating on QuickBooks. We have public companies still operating on QuickBooks. At some point, they grow out of it and move to the next level of accounting system. But even the smallest businesses now can operate on QuickBooks. And if they don't want to incur the cost, they can use third-party firms and consultants that are licensed on QuickBooks that can do their QuickBooks accounting for them. So there shouldn't be a, a business out there that's not running on an accounting system. It doesn't mean they need to own that accounting system, but they should be using a consultant, maintaining their books on a accounting system because it will allow for more accurate accounting. It will allow for a repository in case there's a da data loss and it'll allow for the prevention of fraud because it does have a double-based system so that, that, so that debits and credits are always equal and they're, and, they're, and they're the same and they're, they're not, they're not uh, going to need to be a project of rebuilding the accounting system if there would be if the Excel file crashed or went wrong. Got it. And, and now, and now, Scott, j just your perspective on, look, many entrepreneurs, founders, even businesses that are growing, don't believe in investing in an accounting function. All right. They may, to your point, there's a choice of outsourcing. There also could be a choice of fractional type of accounting help versus full time. Share a perspective on that. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Look, outsourcing plays a huge role, not just in small companies, but in large companies as well. Um, and it, it evolves over time. Um, for small companies, I mean, to me, it makes perfect sense to be outsourcing your accounting because there are firms that specialize in this and can do it on a relatively inexpensive basis. And it would, well, it will allow that company to avoid the, the, the time and the money spent on recruiting and training and retraining if and when people, when people leave. Um, so I always advise people initially to outsource their accounting. And then if they're not, if, if the outsource group isn't meeting their needs on a, either from a qualification or a timeliness perspective, as that company grows, they can decide to in-house. Typically hiring a bookkeeper, someone to maintain the books isn't overly expensive. As that business gets more complicated, that bookkeeper may no longer be adequate um, or just by themselves be adequate. And then it can get more, more expensive as you build out the accounting function. And then again, companies will look at outsourcing a full accounting function. Um, so you can start with outsourcing, then you can insource for eight to 10 years, and then you could potentially outsource again when your 
accounting and finance group grows to be 10, 12, 20 people. Um, but I always recommend smaller companies to start off outsourcing um, because you avoid the investing in people and investing in accounting systems. Got it. Right, Scott. So, okay, now we'll get up the ante. Now we're going to talk about we got past the early stage and now we may be in the the growth stage, companies making money, it's established its markets, et cetera. Now we're possibly talking about strategic changes, right? So how important is it, Scott, for a business to conduct a thorough assessment of its current accounting and administrative processes? And what key areas would you recommend that should be examined? Yeah, well, so if, there, if a company is looking at a strategic change, whether that's bringing in uh, a minority investor, whether that's selling the entire company, whether that's uh, buying a company, um, whether that's potentially going down the IPO track, yeah. um, full assessment across all functions need to be done, not just accounting administrative, but from an accounting perspective, what you really don't want is, let me back up, the lender, the investor, the underwriter, they're going to do due diligence. And on, on, on the company and on your company. And what, what you don't want is the due diligence blowing the deal or deferring the deal. Um, and that could happen if the accounting department is viewed as not being adequate enough to support the new business post the strategic change. Um, that can, and, and if that comes up in diligence, they can blow the deal and they could defer the deal. And why deferring the deal can be a problem is, you know, Richard, the window of opportunity for a seller can quite, in these volatile markets that we're in, um, can quite often shrink. So even deferring a deal by 90 days, while the company tries to build up their accounting group to be sufficient for the potential buyer or investor, in, the, in 90 days, that opportunity could be gone. And that potential transaction could be lost potentially forever. And it's a shame that that would happen because of the account. So mm -hmm. I always try to advise people, although I, I, I start off by saying it's not my dollar, not my money being spent. I usually recommend if you know you're going down the path of doing something pretty significant, start investing in, in your accounting and administrative functions. And that, but by the way, that's not just accounting and finance. It's IT, it's HR, and it's legal. Start to do that well in advance of, running a process because you don't you know that the, the potential investors are going to run diligence across the probably those four functions and any and a blow in any one of those four could blow the whole deal understood and and what would be your advice on you know the time to prepare how many how many what time period before a potential strategic change would you advise companies to start preparing yeah so that's a tough one because um if you start too early you're spending money on you know overhead and infrastructure that may never come you know, bring value because you never made it to the next level you wanted to. But if you start too late, you 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 potentially lose this window of opportunity when the iron is hot and you want to strike and, and and do a deal. So there you know it's a balancing act and a compromise. But I would say if if you have a really good feel that in the if if you're at the beginning of the year and you're looking out 12 months and you know you want to do something in the next 12 month period to start then, because by the way, some of these fixes, they don't happen immediately. Like if they involve hiring and retaining and training people, that can take time. Um, you know, that involves, you know, implementing a new system or acquiring tools to allow you to report in a more efficient and effective manner. That can take time. So I would say probably a 12 month window. Is, is the right is the right amount of time, but you know there there's no there's no right answer to that. Got it. And so Scott, let, 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 let's let's unpack this now. Let's talk about potentially different ownership structures. Let's talk about maybe different funding mechanisms. Let's start with the easiest one first. I want to go out and get some money from the bank, commercial commercial facility of some sort, maybe a revolver of some sort. What is the bank looking for? So let's let's take a mirror and turn it round now, right? I'm the company. I want to go and get some money. Uh, all right. It could be asset based lending or, you know, pure cash flow basis. What's the bank going to require of me? Let's let's focus in on the the accounting, the financials and reports and and so on. What would they be, what, what are they going to be looking for? Well, so you alluded at the front end. It, it depends on the nature of the uh, of the of the paper that the bank will be issuing. Right. An asset based yep. loan. They're really going to be concerned with the quality of the collateral the physical 
physical security of the collateral, the ability of the borrower to report on that collateral, whether that's inventory or accounts receivable or, or some type of, of tangible um, facility. Um, because on a monthly basis, and no more than a quarterly, the bank is going to want to ensure post-closing that there's an adequate collateral base to support the amount that's outstanding. Um, so accounting systems play a huge part in that. People play a huge part on it because the bank's going to want to trust those individuals signing those borrow, borrowing-based certificates. On a cash flow loan, a more traditional uh, non-ABL loan, they're going to they're going to they're they're going to be concerned with the quality of the people reporting, but they're going to be mostly concerned with the cash flow generation of the business. So they'll look back historical how what that company has been able to do. They'll look at the projections um, and they'll try to evaluate how likely it is that the borrower will be able to hit their numbers that they're projecting. And then the, the protections they'll put in place as a lender is they'll put financial covenants in place so that if the projections aren't being hit, it can trigger covenant non-compliance, but then gives the bank it avails the bank to a number of rights and remediation uh, things that they could do from a legal perspective to help, in essence, cure, cure any damage damages they, they, they might be about to face. Brilliant. Okay, Scott, this is great. This is going to be really helpful. So, all right. So I've got my accounting um, house in order somewhat. You mentioned earlier cash versus gap. Now let's talk because the typical entrepreneur is going to want to, you know, is going to start with cash and Maybe I'm investing in the accounting, but now a sudden leap to gap has got to occur, right? What specifically in that bank scenario, what are the type of gap things that they're looking for? They obviously want overall gap set of financials, et cetera. But when we talk about collateral or even kind of on a cash flow basis, what are the kind of gap implications that they'll be looking for particularly? So not all lenders will require gap financials. Um, most entrepreneurs are reporting in, under their tax basis of accounting initially, yep. whether that's cash or accrual or modified yes. accrual. Um, so depending on the size of the loan and whether it's a asset-based loan or a cash flow loan, because there's more risk in a cash flow loan as it relates to numbers, m many lenders don't require gap audited financials or some only require reviewed financials, which are gap but they're obviously a lot less um, reliance than it would be on, on an audited financial. But, but let's just assume the question is when a bank does require audited financials as a, as a condition for the loan or a covenant in the loan, you know, it's full gap. There's no, there's no real, there's no compromise gap here. Um, what does it take to convert for a relatively complex company to convert from cash to accrual? People tend to, people overestimate, underestimate, that conversion process all the time. Usually if I'm meeting with a group and they need an audit for the first time because of their bank lender and they're on cash, I immediately refer them to a consultant to come in there who has done this a number of times to quickly convert them. Because Richard, it's not normally, it's not typically only one year they need converted. It's, it's usually right. at least two, sometimes three years. Yeah. Um, and those records are not always available. And most of the time, the in-house accounting people have no idea what they have to do to convert their financials to approval. No idea because they haven't been through it before. And that's where the, the third party consultants come in that, that specialize in this type of work and they can do it quickly. They're not inexpensive, but it's money well spent. Where do you find, Scott, that companies on that conversion to GAP? Let's talk specifically, uh, you know, you know, GAP requirements, where do they fall down? I mean, is it things like, you know, accounting for inventory or accounting for AR or revenue recognition in that stage of growth, when we're talking about banks and so forth, um, where do companies, smaller companies typically fall down? Oh my God, I did it on a cash base on a tax base, but I re didn't realize all of a sudden now my revenue is on a different basis or my inventory is on a different basis or my AR. Where do you typically find companies fall down? Yeah, so the basic working capital stuff, and, and this this part, I wouldn't call it falling down. They just never had to do it, but at least they can wrap their head around it. It's, you know, it's booking, instead of booking revenue as cash is received, you, you book revenue when the earnings process is complete. So yeah. now you've got accounts receivable on your books and vice versa on the dispersion side, instead of booking expense only when cash is dispersed, you're, you're actually accruing for the payables. That's basic stuff. And, and typically entrepreneurs can wrap their head around that, 
right? Because the basic concept of receivable and payables, and yeah. they tend to turn quickly enough that it's almost cash like. Yeah. It's some of the other stuff that's really hard to explain lease accounting, yeah. um, the relatively new revenue recognition rules where it doesn't always match when you get, you could collect cash and not book revenue for another eight to 10 months, especially if you're a company that offers service contracts or some form of warranties. Um, you've got payables that can be long-term in nature. They could be pension related payables. They can be litigation related payables. Um, they're going to be payables related to contracts that, that will sit as deferred revenue uh, liability on the balance sheet. That's really hard to look. It's hard to explain that to accountants, let alone yes. entrepreneurs. Yeah. And they many times they'll be like, "Oh my God, you are! Why are you whacking my earnings? Yes. Because these things that don't make any sense." But you know, you you just have to explain that over time, it will work itself out. But in a given period, it may seem a little irrational. But over time, over two or three year period, the accumulated earnings will be the same. It just you know you have to follow this matching principle. Got it, Scott. And you mentioned, because we're going to step it up to P and then maybe to an IPO um, in, in a few minutes. You mentioned review, there, there could be, you know, compilation, review, audit, just for the listeners in the small businesses, which could be accepted by a bank. What's the difference between a review and an audit? Yeah, yeah. Good, uh, good question. So, um, well, a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. That's how much it costs which is why banks will often compromise with the review. So, yes. so a review, what a review will do is it requires the issuing party, let's say the borrower in this case, to prepare gap financials. Yes. And to, including footnotes, and the set of financials would look exactly like an audited set of financials would look, except they weren't audited. Um, there's some basic uh, minimal procedures that have to be done for an accounting firm like ours to issue a review opinion. It's inquiring of the uh, of management, it's tying out supporting details to the general ledger and trial balance. But with an audit where, where, where we will sample that underlying data to actually source documents, that's not required in the review. So the financials will be gap-like but they could potentially be wrong or inaccurate because they have not been subject to audit. Whether that's those irregularities are intentional or unintentional, they still may be wrong because they were not subject to an audit. But a gap set of financials with footnotes have, has been produced and there is an opinion by the third party firm indicating that the review standards have been met. And that's why third parties like banks will often rely on that as a compromise to nothing versus an audit. Whereas in an audit, it's a comprehensive review, although it's not 100% testing, there's a sampling methodology that needs to be followed in order for us to issue our audit opinion. And in that sampling methodology, we're taking those underlying transactions to supporting details and verifying that they're accurate. Got it, okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, so let's go to the next step now. So now I've got my my you know basic commercial financing. Now I want to go the PE route. Now I want to hit that one now. How does getting your house in order from a financial accounting reporting you know standpoint change now up the ante now to potentially PE? Yeah. Um, so let's assume that that entrepreneur owned company that's um, and those sponsors that. It's already been audited. Although we come across a lot of opportunities where an entrepreneur decides to run a process to sell, institutional ownership like private equity is, is the logical buyer and they've never been audited. Um, in the old days, the investment banker, that's if there's an investment banker, they would have forced the entrepreneur to be audited. Um, in this environment, we have seen um, sell-side due diligence, which the investment banker often recommends the entrepreneur to have done on their own company in advance of the private equity group running their buy-side due diligence. We have seen at times sell-side due diligence qual um, satisfy an audit requirement for a potential buyer. Um, although I will tell you most of the time, entrepreneurs are forced to have their company audited, okay? Mm -hmm. If they're already audited, I would tell you the added, the added things to look at is one, 
consider doing sell side due diligence, which is happening in almost every deal now. I would say 80% of the deals that are taking a market have sell side due diligence already done. And two, start looking at those four areas I had mentioned before. Accounting, including people and systems, right? Is it Are they going to be satisfactory and sufficient post-transaction to be able to operate under a new world, right? Quicker reporting, more uh, more complicated reporting, a lot more demanding reporting than what was done in the past. HR, IT, and legal, right? They all have to be looked at because private equity is going to run heavy due diligence. And as I mentioned before, you don't want a failure in any of those four areas to result in a failed deal or a deferred deal. Because private equity doesn't have a lot of patience, right? They'll just move on to the next deal. And if the economic environment changes, and you know, you assume the economic environment is, is favorable to the seller, which is why they're running a process in the first place. If that turns, that window of opportunity can go away really quickly. And we've seen so many clients where they were ready to sell their company for $200 million and miss that opportunity. And for whatever reason, five years later, that company was a zero right? Because, you know, something failed along the way and that, that entrepreneur just missed their opportunity to monetize all of their sweat equity. And it's really a shame when that happens. Got it. And so um, from a P standpoint, from your experience, Scott, tell us a little bit about what P's would probably expect from a, an organizational standpoint. Let's talk about financial, you know, um, accounting and finance from a system standpoint, and then from an internal control standpoint, just talk a little bit about those three domains. Yeah, I mean, so they don't really require any anything. They, they just want to buy a good business that they think they can, you know, double in five years. If it, if there's a ton of red flags, it, will, could, have, it could impact pricing or they could just decide to walk away and go to the next deal that yeah. they're evaluating and they have to do one. If they like the deal and there's a deficiency in one of those four areas, they'll just factor that into the price and quickly remediate that deficiency post-closing, but it will impact pricing. Um, so I wouldn't say they mandate anything. What they mandate is a good business and a qualified management team, right? That's what they mandate. Does it help? Will help your company look better than the other three companies are look, they're, they're looking at at the same time? For sure. And will it maximize pricing? It definitely will. But, but unlike an IPO, they're not going to mandate internal controls. They would love to have a qualified CFO, but if they don't, They'll just hire one um, after the fact. Even if it's not an accounting system that, that meets their, their standards, they'll just implement one. But they'll build that into their model and say, okay, if we're going to spend a million dollars to fix all of this, we're going to take a million dollars off the purchase price. Let's roll the dice a bit here. Scott, what have you seen in terms of turns that, you know, from a valuation standpoint, uh, the impact on turns and valuations by not having your account yeah. financial house in order or I wish I was smart enough to, or I wish I had enough data to be able to prove that out. I could support selling my services a lot more. You know, you know, there's a lot of puts and takes when it comes to uh, multiples, right. And it's always evolving. Um, so I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that it will impact purchase price. And I don't know Richard, if it's as much of a multiple issue than it is of, if I was going to pay 80 million and I think I need a million to get you to where you should have been in the first place, I'm only going to pay you 79. Got it. Right. Something, something like that. But, and that's my personal opinion. You know, I've, I've never been on that side of it. I, I, I don't think it's as important as it is in, in doing a true quality of earnings and making sure your revenue and your customers and your sales force um, are really all there, but it, it does play a role, but it, I don't know if it plays a role that can, significantly impact the purchase price explain quality of earnings uh scott because you mentioned that one and that's obviously a key procedure for most of the pe firms right um you know so just just explain what you mean by that yeah so most of the time for private equity or any institutional owner uh or is going to use a market approach to pricing the company right everything we learned in finance class about discounted cash flows and what we call an income approach no one's really doing that one is complicated and um, two, it, it's not really what market-based buyers and sellers are, are, are using to price companies. They're using a market approach. And absent a full appraisal on a company, the simplest form of market approach is to take an earnings benchmark, most commonly, most commonly EBITDA if it's a profitable company, could be revenue if it's, if it's not a profitable company, 
and applying to that benchmark a, a multiple that is market driven, right? That's commanded by that given industry in the market at that point in time based on market factors, right? So if it's an EBITDA multiple and, and it's in a technology industry, it can be high at 18 to 20. If it's in a, a more mature cycle, um, it can be as low as five or six, and, it, and then quite often something in between. So what the quality of earnings will do is because they're relying so much on EBITDA, and it's typically historical EBITDA, not, not projected EBITDA, because they're relying so much on EBITDA, they will, the, the buyers will force a quality of earnings um, study on the seller to ensure that the EBITDA as reported is accurate. Um, so the buyer will do that and then they'll make adjustments to the EBITDA as necessary, which is why we recommend to our sellers and so will investment bankers to get out ahead of that and run a sell side quality of earning on yourself yep. to help identify issues that a buyer, it would be like if you were selling your home, you would do an inspection, which more and more people are doing now. You'd run an inspection on your own home so that you could identify the issues the buyer's inspection company will identify and fix them so it, it will speed up the pace of the transaction because that window of opportunity can narrow very quickly and you don't want it to uh, to fail because you're in, you're, in, you're in a heavy due diligence that has taken longer than it should. Got it. Okay. So before we move on past um, PE, are there any table stakes as regards the accounting environment, you know, internal controls or so forth that just have to be in place for you even to start even talking about or considering PE? So I would say the, the only real table stakes is to have a system in place that can allow you to generate the data uh, that the buyer is going to want to see. If you yeah. don't have that, then you're not getting it. You're not getting a deal done. And it, and it has to be a system that's nimble because what will happen is the, the seller will populate the data room, which is virtual these days with a bunch of data that the investment banker thinks the buyer is going to want to look at. The buyer will come in and when they start doing their own diligence, even before quality of earnings, which is often done by a third party, they'll start having added requests. And if the accounting system isn't capable of producing those requests, the deal is dead. So okay. those are the table stakes. You've got to have a system in place, data repository, um, and people who can extract that data so that when the buyers, hopefully plural buyers, are requesting the data, you we can produce it in a very quick manner. Other than that, whether it's people and other things, they can, you know, they can hire up to their standards. But to me, that that's what I would view as the table stakes. Right. Okay. Let's go up another rung now. So I want to do an IPO. Yeah. How do I get Wait, my those, don't, those, those don't happen anymore, do they? <laughs> <laughs> Not the last year and a half. I wake up one morning and I think I want to do an IPO. What's the, uh, how do I get my house in order? What's the yeah, state so, level now? So that's a lot more significant because yep. in, a, in, a, in an IPO, the underwriter, and they're obligated by law yes. to perform due diligence. Because they're an underwriters under the securities rule have a lot more liability than the underwriters in a representing a buy a seller in a private transaction. In fact, the underwriters in a public deal are required to run due diligence on behalf of all the investors like you and I that would be lucky enough to invest in that IPO because we're not able to run due diligence. We, we're not privy to that information. Um, and that due diligence is unbelievably comprehensive from both an accounting and a legal perspective. Um, especially legal. We've seen a lot of IPOs really stall or get significantly delayed because they couldn't produce contracts, um, employment agreements, and they have to be signed. And a lot of entrepreneurs have all these documents in uh, all around their office and they realize they're not signed or that they've expired and they have to quickly go out and re-up them and then people want to negotiate. Um, there's a lot of things on the legal side. On the accounting side, I can, I'll assume they've been audited, but if they haven't, you got you could require at least two or three years of audited financials, depending on how big of an offering you're going to do. Um, and then on the in internal control side, some of the recent changes uh, with the Jobs Act have reduced the level of internal control scrutiny upon the IPO, it's kind of deferred it for five years. So on the on the control side, you can still be a little bit lax and be okay. But the second you go public, the clock starts ticking 
and you've got to start implementing controls pretty quickly. Most of the time, people will start getting those controls all set up in advance, not to be at an A plus at the time of the IPL, but to at least go from being, let's say, a D to you know a B or B minus with the intent of becoming an A or A plus two or three years into being public. And so that um, that the internal control environment, right? Where would you say, give us the top three. Where would you say from an internal control, if we get up to that level of maybe IP and even maybe PE, where would you say, which internal controls would you particularly focus on at the beginning, you know? Yeah, yeah. So there's three, of the three, there's two clear points of failure. One is information technology. Yes. Right? Because there's a whole set of, of standards that are around how IT should look access to, to the IT systems, um, physical security of source code, change management, um, cyber security. Yeah. Uh, that's one, so that's, that's the number one area. And the number yep. two area is financial reporting. Yeah. Right. Just not having segregation of duties in, uh, in place, not being able to produce gap financials in a timely manner, not being able to account for income taxes or some of the more complex areas. Um, those by far are the top two. I would say the third, Richard, is probably accounting for non-standard transactions. So it's kind of one-offs, new debt arrangement that might have a embedded derivative, accounting for warrants, um, business combination accounting. People are doing yeah. that for the first time. They don't realize how complicated that can be. Um, entering into arrangements with, with international companies, and now you have, F, you have foreign currency to deal with. Um, consolidation, the non-standard. Those are probably the top three, but the top two for sure are IT and financial reporting. And what about, um, you know, I want to get into the IP world and, and a public company. What about um, SEC regulations that govern kind of accounting transactions potentially? And our dear friend Sarbanes-Oxley, just talk a little bit about those two areas that I've got, I've got to start potentially considering. Yeah, so Sarbanes Oxley, um, th there's two there's two certifications that are tied to internal controls around financial reporting, um, and they both fall under Section 404 of the Sarbanes Oxley. So, with a new with an IPO under the Jobs Act, and Jobs Act probably got to put in place, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago. Yep. And this was in an effort to uh, reduce the cost of going public, and yep. it actually worked. We had like a record number of IPOs post the Jobs Act. But what it what the Jobs Act did is it um, it actually reduced the burden of internal control reporting for a five year period. So before before the Jobs Act, once the company went public, they had to comply with both Section four hundred four A, which is management certifying the effectiveness of their internal controls over financial reporting, and then four hundred four B, which is the auditors um, attesting to management's assessment over internal controls, meaning the auditors would come in and not only do a financial statement audit, but they'd also do have to do an, an audit under internal controls. And this was all a result of, of Enron um, yep. and World, Worldcom, the frauds that happened there. Yes. What the Jobs Act did is it said, okay, for a five-year period, we will not require the auditors to provide their, their, their report. Uh, management will still have to do their assessment of internal controls over financial reporting, but for a five-year period, the company can avoid the cost of having the auditors have to come in and audit management certification. And that, that reduced the, the cost of being public by a significant amount. There were other things the Jobs Act put in place to reduce the cost, but that was the largest one that clearly had an impact on, on accounting firms like mine um, and probably was the single largest cost reduction. That would that would uh, that was av available to the uh, to registrants, and it, like I said, it might have been a product of the times, but we had a I think other than the dot com boom, I think that was a, the the largest number of IPOs in a two or three year period that we had had in a very long time. How do how do how do companies have to think, um, Scott? Because you mentioned um, a couple of kind of quote unquote certifications. How do I get companies will get information? They outsource all of these, you know processes, whether it's payroll or, you know, AP, whatever it is, uh, to companies that they rely on their controls. Talk a little bit about some of the certifications or the reports that auditors will rely on to make sure that the outsource, the outsourcer is basically doing the right things, you know, from their processes. 
Yeah, and, and so you're referring to service organizations, right? Yes. And the simplest yes. form is, is ADP. Right? Yeah. I mean, they're the most well, I would say the most well-known service yep. organization. In essence, they're processing information, yep. in this case, payroll. Yep. But the registrar, in this case, the public company, is relying on ADP's report to book entries to the general ledger. So the internal controls that need to be in place need to be those at ADP, right? right? There's some controls that need to be in place at the user entity, which yep. is the registrant, but the processing controls. Yes. So I don't know who invented this product, but the, it, they had a tremendous foresight, but they came up with a new set, uh, a new audit, which is was, was called SOC reporting. Yep. Um, and firms like ours, any CPA firm would go to ADP and, and perform an audit just of their controls. And that report that they would deliver to ADP would be used only by the company that would engage with ADP. So we call that SOC reporting. In this environment of hosting and, 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 and this automated environment that's continuing to evolve, SOC reporting is becoming a lot more prevalent. It used to be just ADP or maybe your transfer agent that held your stock, but now it could be a hosting company. It could be the company hosting QuickBooks for you. It can be a company processing insurance claims if you, if you have self-insurance. Um, we're seeing a lot of it. It actually helped our business quite a bit. And we're actually recommending some of our customer, our clients that do processing for others to go and have SOC reports done because I, I call it a, uh, you know, the gold standard. It's like a seal of approval. Um, in fact, potentially you can, our clients can lose a contract if they don't have a third party SOC report because certain companies won't do business with processing companies if they can't demonstrate the fact that they've been audited. Absolutely. Okay. So, so how I'm um, going to answer your question though. So how does that, how does that relate to if when I'm looking at internal controls, yep. I now have to extend that work in that key area to the third party. If they have a SOC report, I can rely on that. If they don't have a SOC report, technically I have to go on site and test their control, just like I'd be testing controls on my own client. And that becomes a real headache. And can be and become very expensive. So you you you, measure, you, you mentioned the potential um, you know intersection of cybersecurity, maybe even, even privacy. How does that interrelate, Scott, with the accounting area and financial area, as regards you know keeping information private, the privacy acts and so forth? Talk a little bit more because that is a big area, Scott. We all know that, and all companies so, of all sizes need to be mindful of that now. You know. Yeah. So so our clients. Uh, cyber and data privacy rules that that doesn't really affect our our auditing of their account mm -hmm. right um it would impact our assessment of their internal control system yep and it also impacts our ability to um assess the reliability of the data yep. because if they had weak if they had weak cyber controls when people could hack their system and potentially their accounting system it lends towards the reliability of the data that our client is giving to us to audit, right? Um, but for the most part, it doesn't play a huge role. At our firm, it plays a huge role because now we house accounting data on our of our clients' accounting data. So we have to have cyber and data privacy. So it, it was a big deal for us um, in in the our ability to prevent a uh, you know a leak of information. But from our client's perspective, it's just another thing we look at. But I wouldn't say it plays a huge role in the actual reporting in the account. Got it. Now, Scott, you know, at that stage, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking fast growth, you know, mid-sized type companies looking to maybe go public or even do the private equity thing. You know, the entrepreneurial spirit is always optimism and so forth, right? But in terms of preparation, pre preparing your accounting and administrative house, you've got to focus on risk management. All right. What role does that play in the context of administrative and accounting functions? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say with a smaller company, the, the you know, the, the risk management is is more around, you know, it's more around the business and, and, and losing customers, making sure you have adequate insurance. Um, and then as the company, as the company evolves, it becomes it, it becomes more of a holistic view. Um, and as, and when the company becomes large, then then the risk management function is is can be around HR. It can be around HR compliance. It can be responding, you know, adequately to, to litigation uh, yeah. matters. 
It can be it can be talent management, yeah. right? Um, yeah. The ability to it can be aligning culturally with yeah. your customers and ESG now. Um, so it the you know the whole risk management process we get this question a lot because it, it's really not subject to audit, but it it it, it it's more of a advisory type of play. It evolves on based on the size of the company, right? Yeah. I mean, it complete it completely changes, and you don't want to overdo it when you're early stage, because you can spend a whole lot of money on that function and you don't want to underdo it when you're larger, because you can, you know, companies can, can, can really fall off to their competition if they're not doing a good job in, in risk management, but risk management, it covers a lot more than just accounting. Absolutely. Are there er any areas within accounting and finance that companies should focus on? Again, ta table stakes type of conversation. Is there anything particularly one or two that, Company should focus from a on. risk from a risk management perspective. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. D data backup. Right. The, the worst thing that can happen is a data loss. I mean, yeah. it, I don't know. I've ever seen a full loss where you'd have to recreate. I've heard of them before. We have to recreate your accounting records off off source documents. That would be a, the, I mean, that would just be a disaster. Um, obviously, going um, offline in your system that where you're not able to provide timely, like with everything being online now not having the servers in place and, and, and your accounting system being offline, that could be a risk, but that would just impact how quickly you report. But to me, data loss, um, and then obviously a breach of that yes. data. Because sometimes accounting systems will house PII and PHI, yes. including credit card information, right? Um, yes. In fact, we, we've seen a number of those where they're billing off of credit cards. And if God forbid there was a breach there, there would be a disaster. So to me, those would be the two largest areas is, is cyber and data backup. Perfect, brilliant answer, love that. Okay, in the ever evolving landscape of regulation, Scott, how can uh, businesses stay ahead of compliance and, and to ensure their accounting practices are not only current, but also adaptable to future regulatory changes? Yeah, so, so regulation doesn't really impact accounting that much other than or maybe around taxes. Like, yeah. like if you think about, if you think about the process of collecting sales tax and remitting, right, you yeah. need to be able to accurately report that so that when you go to remit to the government, you're remitting both timely and the appropriate amounts, right? Mm -hmm. But for the most part, for private companies, regulation is, is compliance is outside of the accounting system, right? Absent when you're uh, you being an agent for collecting and remitting. Now, if you're a public company, there is a, an, a piece of compliance that is around reporting. Um, but as a private company, there's not that much intersection. It's more of a risk management play than it is an accounting and finance play. Got it. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about, we, we'll continue on the continuum of, of maturity of the accounting and financial department. So in your experience, Scott, how important is it for businesses to invest in training and developing their finance and accounting teams? especially during periods of change? Well, you know, it all depends how strong your team is. Um, yeah. You know, the accounting and finance piece, obviously you need them to have the industry technical knowledge. But where, where accounting, and I'll use finance and FP&A, right? Yes. Where, where there's really a need for training, and we've seen people who, uh, who are very much in demand because they have these skills, is it's really, really intense Excel skills because, you know, with Excel, with these pivot tables and lookups and everything, you can run a whole lot of database management um, functions just off Excel without having to go and buy a data management tool if you've got the right person driving it. The other area, and you've probably seen this in, 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 your, in your work, is Power BI. Yes. And the, yes. And the, the power that it comes from business intelligence tools. I mean, we're using it at our firm, but if, if, if if somebody in the FP&A group has the ability to write queries in Power BI, the, the, the strength in the reporting, not just the way it looks and you know, putting it over Tableau and, and all these pretty reports, but just the, the unbelievable insight that can be garnered from Power BI if, if, they, if they're being written in a way that allows the users of that data to make decisions off of. Um, and it's to me, it's a relatively new tool. So you know, I would I, if it were me and I was starting all over again, I would train myself up in, in those two areas. Obviously, data analytics. Problem with data analytics and AI is they're not they're not really a go to tool right now. 
to train in. Um, but just, you know, obviously to get keyed up in that area. But accounting, I, I wouldn't say there it's that important. I think it's more important in these powerful P, uh, FP&A type of tools. Um, that's where I would spend the, my dollars on, on, on training and development. That's awesome. But now this is for private. Obviously for SEC companies and public yes. companies, that's different. The reporting people, but usually you're you're hiring a director of financial reporting that just does SEC reporting, and that person should already have the training and or will go seek the training on their own. But for private companies, I would train my people more around these powerful reporting tools. Got it. Have you seen in, in the in the former example you just mentioned about you know the public world and having to stay abreast of you know changes in compliance and regulation? Have you seen you know, companies where they just missed a new gap pronouncement and all of a sudden, come the year end, the results aren't exactly what they expected. I, I, I mean, is that a risk to companies? I hope not. I mean, if we're doing our job as auditors, we're, we're, we're planning with them and reminding yep. everybody. Have I seen people not apply the accounting properly? Yes, um, I have seen that. And that that's pretty bad. It can result in a contentious... Um, situation between auditor and, and the client. Yeah. And it can yeah. also make that individual not look great. Um, you know, in a private environment, we try to work with them along the way as they're as they're working through the accounting. In a public one, you got to create a little bit more of a of a barrier between auditor and registrant, but there's still there's still a lot of advice that we can give in that situation that you that you wouldn't have a total blow. Um, but some of these new standards require so much uh, subjectivity. Yeah, that it's really hard to get everything right every time. It's really a tough environment. Um, hopefully, there's a little bit more flexibility between auditor and 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 client these days. But it, it it's really tough. Good thing is we haven't had a major. There's only been at two major standards in the last five years. Um, seems like the 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 regulatory bodies are slowing down on kind of spitting out complex accounting, which is good. Um, but when these big ones like the RevRec one or the lease yep. accounting comes up, it, it creates yep. um, creates a whole lot of issues. Absolutely. So um, let's talk about the change management principles about getting your house in order, because, you know, at the early stages, I'm sure you can envision it. You've got the accountant in the back office, right? You know, churning out financial reports on uh, on QuickBooks. But as you start to mature and now you kind of get into the, kind of the strategic world with changes, the, the accounting and financial organization has got to be plugged into the business. All right. And so one of the first change management principles is obviously appropriate open communication and transparency within the financial and account departments as it relates to the business. Tell us about, you know, how can businesses open that up? Are you talking about in a situation where you're running a process to sell or just in general? Just in general. Just in yeah. general, le leading up, because we're talking about this is advanced preparation for potentially a big strategic change, but you've got to get into the habit of that. That doesn't just become a, a light switch at any point in time. Tell us about how does they get how do they get more plugged into the business to understand not only the opportunities, but also the risks in the business. So, yeah. So, I mean, it is instrumental that whoever's running the accounting group, that, that could be a CFO, it could be a CAO, and it could be a control right, could potentially be a controller running it. That person has got to have a direct line to executive management and the operations team. Unfortunately, in an entrepreneurial environment, especially a family-owned environment, we quite, quite often see the entrepreneurs treat that data as confidential. Yes. Or treat a lot of um, strategic things that are happening as confidential and, yes. and in essence, blocking out the individual who's heading up accounting, and that is terrible. And, and the entrepreneur is not doing it intentionally. It's just part of their DNA because they've come through an environment where the family has always protected that data from the employees, right, for whatever reason. But the head of accounting needs to be brought underneath the tent. And a lot of times it's an educational process um, that quite often the controller will use the auditors as the stick and say, listen, I wasn't able to account for this because I didn't know about the contract until after it was signed. You've got to go tell, you know, and then we'll be the one reporting it and we'll try to close that gap. But sometimes it, it can't be closed because it is a DNA issue, right? Um, 
and it's a challenge mostly with family businesses. Um, but it, it's a it's one that is very very common, and one that can result in very ineffective accounting and financial reporting. Without naming any clients or anything like that, can you give an example so we really get the impetus behind this point? Because it's a brilliant point, Scott. Thank you for talking about this. It's a brilliant point because you know. In the kind of myopic viewpoint, sometimes of entrepreneurs, you know, well, why do the finance people need to know this? They really don't understand the the totality of the responsibility, right? Especially when they're looking for financing or going to PE or maybe going to IPO one day. Can you give an example of a real kind of downside case where, you know, it wasn't probably transparent communication that led to an issue ultimately up the pole? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, there's a lot of them. I mean, we'll 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 come in and do the audit. Um, we'll and I don't know how it could be through legal letters. It could be through interviews. It could be through a number of you know, searching on the internet. We become aware of an arrangement that has not been accounted for at all. It's not in, forget accounted for wrong. It's not in the system. And then when we bring it to our point of contact, sometimes. They don't even know that a legal arrangement had been entered into. That's like a worst case scenario, but it ha has happened on a number of occasions. And then we're like, and they're like, you know, no one's no one's bringing these to me, so I can't account for them. Or, or there's an arrangement, but they're not privy to the underlying agreement, and they have to try to account for it based on the interpretation they're getting of the agreement. And then we get the agreement, right? Because we have to, and we're the auditors, and we realize it was accounted for improperly. Um, where we see a lot of um, uh, where we see this a lot of times is around um, employer rewards. Yes, like profit interest, um, anything that's related to a bonus arrangement. Sometimes even the CFO isn't privy to the what's happening around their organization. I've had situations, uh, Richard, where I've had to go to the owner and get the data and not even be able to share the data with the CFO. I come up with the accounting. I give the entries to the CFO and the CFO never sees the underlying support because the entrepreneur doesn't want the CFO to know which employees have received what awards because the CFO might be upset that it wasn't proportionate to what that person had got. I've had that on more than one occasion, probably closer to 10 occasions. And by the way, not just entrepreneur, even private equity. Yeah, sure. uh, In fact, it happens mostly in private equity. They don't want to wow. share that data because private equity is more likely to have profit interest. Right. Interesting. Okay. Great advice. Thank you for that. So let's talk a little bit about um, scaling and adapting to evolving needs, right? So, so Scott, as businesses anticipating growth and other strategic changes, how can they ensure that their accounting and administrative processes as scalable and adaptable to evolving needs. Yeah. And this goes kind of, of like how often do you look out and when do you start moving, right? You have you got to, one, you got to have a feel for what your business is going to look like over the next 12 months to all the way to 36 months. And then you have to evaluate your infrastructure, not just accounting and finance. It could be physical infrastructure. It could be your IT, et cetera, um, and start moving on it. As companies get further along, consultants play a huge part in this. Because consultants are objective, right? Whereas the parties internally are not. They have yeah. biases. And two, the consultants carry that stick. And it won't come off as uh, as having an agenda or a perceived agenda, which ine inevitably will happen internally, right? Every Either that person will have an agenda or the others will perceive that person making the recommendation of having an agenda. Whereas a consultant is meant to be object objective. Right. Not to mention they're they're experts in this field of identifying gaps and remediating those gaps. I mean, they are. It comes at a cost, but they're experts at it. They've seen best practices a gazillion times. So, but more importantly, I tell people they're objective and they can carry that stick for you. Right. And you can even kind of guide them the direction you want while they're the ones carrying the stick. So it needs to be done often. And I recommend using third-party consultants to do that assessment. Perfect, perfect. And so on the same vein, how do businesses, how can they ensure that their accounting and administrative departments align culturally with the broader strategic objectives? 
in terms of their long-term plans? Yeah, so um, that's a tough one because the broader objectives of the company will often change. Yeah. So you might have a company, not you, a company might have a talent um, force that at one point is aligned with the broader objectives culturally, but those broader objectives and culturally have changed. And now that talent base is no longer aligned and yep. you're too close to the process to know that. Again, I, I recommend hiring consultants to come in and do an assessment because one, they're experts at it. Two, they can make objective recommendations and they can be the one carrying the stick because when you're dealing with people and headcount issues, then everyone knows that agendas will be people will believe that there's an agenda on every decision that is made. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So we're doing all this stuff. We're aligning with the business, even maybe potentially culture, et cetera. Are there any, Scott, any specific metrics or key performance indicators that businesses can measure the success of their efforts in getting accounting and finance in order? Uh, I mean, the, it, the problem is it's really hard to associate dollars to getting the house in order. Yeah. But, you know, and you know this, you've been involved in our companies, you know, the, the number of days to close your books, that's always a KPI, mm -hmm. no, right? Number of full-time equivalents to units produced or sales. People will try to benchmark that, right, within industry. That's a KPI. Other than that, I, I'm not real sure that there are you know, very well-known KPIs because frankly, in a non-quantifiable environment, every company is kind of different on what they need. Plus the quality of the people can, some people can carry the job of two people, right? While sometimes one person carries the job of half a person. Um, but I, I would say the KPIs, and I'm curious to what you think, The KP, I would say KPIs are number of days to close and probably FTE to some industry benchmark. Absolutely right. No, those are two. And I'll tell you one thing, whenever I've got controllers, uh, you know, I'm working with a big KPI for me, it would be the number of audit entries at the year end. Yeah. So I was going to say that, but I, you know, I, I never want people thinking that that's a report card. I always tell people in these audits, we have a common goal. That's to get yes. out a clean set of financials in a timely manner. And if that results in entries, or result, you know, it's not a report card, although, although our clients very much want to view it as that. But I do know CFOs and controllers where their bonuses were tied to the number of audit mm -hmm. adjustments, which is like, it creates a hostile environment between client and auditor. I hate that. Um, I'd rather that not be in the bonus arrangement, but I, it, it, it's in there quite a bit. I, I, I hear completely what you're saying. How, how about getting out your audit? In a more timely nature, hundred percent. That you could build fantastic. that into a into a into a bonus arrangement, fantastic. right? No, fantastic. And then, of course, there's one hundred eighty three three sixty type of um, you know um, assessments and so forth, where how much the financial and accounting department is actually involved in the business. You know, that's a more qualitative score. But um, I think you hit the main ones there, Scott. All right, last two questions. This has been brilliant, Scott. By the way, thank you. What great yeah, yeah. wisdom by that. So what are the common mistakes businesses make when it comes to investing in the accounting function? Huh. Um, well, so early on, I would say they tend to overestimate the abilities of their team and yeah. to under underinvest in accounting software, right? Because they don't, you know, it's not viewed as value add. It's, it's really overrated. They, but they tend to overestimate the ability of their accounting team. Like, oh, don't worry. Accounting's going to be clean. I've had this bookkeeper who's been with me for 18 years, right? Everything's perfect. And then you go, you go in there and you realize the person is not qualified and doesn't have the bandwidth to be able to do everything they're going to need to do to, to do accrual-based accounting, get out financials, et cetera. Um, the other thing is I, early stage companies tend to be slow on moving on underperforming individuals yeah, because there tends to be history there, right? Yes. Quite often. Same thing, 17-year person. Um I would, see the, I would say those are the com common mistakes uh, that I'll see on early entrepreneurial-based companies, software and people. So things don't happen without, you know, someone focused on it. All right. And so integrating the accounting financial organization in some type of change management, especially when there's a strategic change, involves someone to do something. 
Scott, otherwise people just get on with their day jobs, right? You have to have an accountable and responsible person to make sure that this transition and this um, you know, journey occurs. Whose responsibility and accountability is that? So again, is this under the question of when when there's something happening? Yes. Yeah. Um, so enterprise wide is the responsibility of the CEO, right? Um, in a simplest form, you know, grassroots type of tactics, right? Town hall meetings. I've seen. I've been a client when they. I've, we we've done town hall meetings at our own firm. You know, where you get everybody together in some room and you sit there and you tell the story so that everybody's hearing the same thing. They may not be interpreting the same thing, but they're hearing it and you can open it up for questions, right? That's not always practical. If you've got this widespread organization, then the other way to do it is you bring all your department heads together and you hold a town hall. And you, but by doing that, you're ensuring one, that the communication by those department heads to their people is both timely, but more importantly, the communication is consistent. That's not as effective as having one town hall because you can't field all the questions, plus it's hearsay yes. as to what the division has actually said to their people. The CEO is not hearing it directly. Um, but to me, that's how it works in its most basic form. Now, are people doing it over email? Yes. Does that work? Probably not. Um, is it efficient? Yeah. <laughs> Can it help protect you legally because it's all in writing? Yes. So, you know, there's a lot of factors to why people don't hold town halls and things. They want they want things documented and how things got communicated so that somebody doesn't say that something else was said in these meetings. But, um, you know, change management's a big deal. I mean, it, it is, is in our deal. firm. It is such a big deal. It is a big deal. And that's for a whole different conversation, Scott. For sure. Scott, yeah. What's your parting advice on getting your accounting and finance house in order for strategic change? Um, I would say don't un, uh, don't underestimate the role of accounting and re and finance in reaching your objectives. Whether this is organic growth, acquisition, sales, IPO, um, and and you've heard me say it a couple of times, and it's not just me trying to sell services. This is all type of outside advisors. Consider bringing in experts, right? Because they can, you know, this is what they do. They they will be objective, and they can help execute and avoid some of the agendas that can, or the perceived agendas that can allow change to fail in execution. Brilliant. Scott, thank you so much. This is fantastic. These are fantastic wisdom bites. Thank you. You've seen a lot of businesses um, over the years um, in the audit profession, as well as I'm sure in many other endeavors you've got. Um, but that outside in approach has been superb, invaluable. Invaluable. Yeah, no, 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 my pleasure. This was fun. It went, uh, time went quickly. I, uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity. I love talking to you. Uh, li likewise, Scott. You're a dear friend. Thank you so much, yeah, Scott. Same. Take Bye, care. Richard. Yeah, take thank care. you. Bye bye. Yeah.